Good morning and welcome. Today we're starting a new series looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul wrote this letter from prison, probably from Rome, under house arrest. You might say he was in lockdown. And he writes to a young church facing many challenges in living out their faith in a Roman city. So turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, I'm not going to look particularly at the comments on thanksgiving and prayer, since we looked at this passage during the series on Paul's prayers a few weeks ago. But I want to focus on just the first couple of verses of Paul and Timothy's letter, which set the scene for working through the letter over the next few weeks. Paul usually starts his letters with some declaration of who he is, and often as a statement of authority. He might say something like, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the call of God. Often he's challenging false teachers or other areas of conflict, and he needs to set out his credentials. He does this in the same way that if we're writing an important letter, we might start by saying, I'm writing this to you in my capacity as such and such, to give some clarity and authority so that they don't simply say, who is this guy and what gives him the right to write to us like this? Paul's letter to the Philippians is interesting because it shows that where that approach is not necessary, he's very humble in the way that he presents himself introducing himself and Timothy simply as servants of Christ Jesus. It ties in very much with what he says later in the letter about humility and following the example of Jesus. And it leads me to ask, in our society, which puts quite a lot of store by position, how do you regard yourself? If you meet someone, how do you start to explain who you are? What is most important to you? What is your identity? What Paul sets out in these first couple of verses underscores that as Christians, our core identity is in Christ and not in whatever position or role we might hold. He then says, as is normal, who he's writing to, but we might be surprised how he describes them. God's holy people or the saints. Again, I wonder, how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as a saint or a sinner? Do you see yourself as holy? We're all sinners, of course, but if we placed our trust in Jesus Christ, we're forgiven sinners. And because Jesus has paid for our sin and dealt with it, God has clothed us in the righteousness of Christ and treats us as if we're righteous pure and holy, as if we're like Jesus himself. I guess if you were to meet someone and introduce yourself, you wouldn't introduce yourself as a shopper because you go to Asda once a week, or as a TV watcher because you sometimes watch television. Those are things you sometimes do, but they don't identify who you really are. In the same way, though we sometimes sin, frequently sin, that doesn't identify who we are. If we put our trust in Jesus as Saviour and Lord and received his forgiveness, then our true identity is in him. Like Paul and Timothy, as a servant of Christ, but also as a saint, as holy. Being holy or being a saint simply means being like Jesus and being righteous which is what we are because we've received that from him. Paul's greeting to them, which follows on from this, is linked closely to it. 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, sometimes explained as God's riches at Christ's expense, is God's free gift to us, given in love and through Jesus' death and resurrection. His gift of forgiveness and new life and eternal life in relationship with him. Peace here does not mean outward peace. It doesn't mean an absence of troubles. Though Paul might wish the Philippians a smooth and easy life, with no persecution, sickness or any of life's storms, he certainly can't promise them that. But more secure is God's inner peace, which he gives us by his spirit. One of the first things that I found in my developing relationship with Jesus and has been there consistently over the last 35 years as a Christian is his peace. There have been many and varied storms which I've encountered, but through them all, I've been aware of my identity and ultimate security in Jesus and God's presence with me by his spirit and his peace and calm. I pray that would be your experience too, through whatever storms you might face, that you would know your identity in Jesus, that you belong to him and are clothed in his righteousness, and that you would know his peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have so many things to thank you for. As we come to the start of this letter, we ask that over the coming weeks, you would speak to us and equip us to live as your servants. We thank you that you count us holy, that you count us as saints, not sinners. And we pray that we, we might grow in holiness and that we might know more of your grace and peace through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ.